Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm very privileged to be able to speak at your project management call. So, uh, like I said, I'm very excited, so I hope you guys are also going to have fun. Um, if you read books like Talk Like Ted, they say the optimum time for presentation is 18 minutes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I've got two hours. <laughs> I hope you're not going to fall asleep, because I am going to go through some theory and some principles like Dion said. But um, hopefully we can do it and um, have it quite engaging. I've handed out some of these cards. Um, in a, on an IT Agile project, we call these user story cards. But I'm going to ask you to write down one, if you have any questions on Agile management or Scrum or Agile, um, Agile project management, one question per card. If you don't have a question, that's fine. Please send it um, to forward. I'm, I'm going to use this uh, when I explain some concepts. So one of the concepts is that you have a, a product backlog list. So I'm going to use your questions as a product backlog list. And then we've got our sprint board on that side. And as we address these questions during the presentation, we are going to take, take them off our project backlog list. Right? <coughs> I did my... So nice to meet you. Um, I didn't really prepare to, to tell you about myself, but I'll just give you a quick background. Um, I've been with Clientel for about a year and a half now. I'm working on their roadmap IT project team as a, as a Scrum Master. Now, when I spoke to Ansi last week, she said people probably don't even know what a Scrum Master is. So I'll, I'll hopefully talk about that a little bit later. Before that, I've um, worked in consulting for 11 years. Um, I've implemented a couple of consulting projects across change management strategy, and we also, um, our company had an HR um, division where we were, um, we had a license for an international talent management product. So one of my first IT projects that I implemented was in 2008 um, for one of the big retailers in South Africa. So I'll, I'll talk about that project a bit later because I've learned so many lessons in doing those kind of things. <coughs> just our agenda for today, um, just a quick introduction, we'll talk about what is Agile project management. And Agile is quite a broad field, but we're only going to focus on Scrum. And so I'll go into Scrum, team roles, ceremonies, artifacts, all those kind of things. And then um, I'll, in the beginning will be some theory, and then it's sort of towards the end I'll start weaving in some of the clientele lessons learned and how we do it there. Um, as you can see, the agenda is on our sprint board that we're going to use today. So this is my first IT software project I worked on. As I said, it was in 2008. We just um, got the license to start selling this project in South Africa, uh, this product in South Africa. It's a global talent management solution. And our first client was a big retailer. Um, over 1,000 stores in South Africa and something like 18,000 employees. Now, as any good project, we kicked off with a project kickoff meeting. We invited all the HR people across South Africa to this, um, this meeting. And we also had the guys from Germany and Poland who were working on the software fly in to help us with workshops. So for the first two and a half months, we spent in design workshops, understanding the business, understanding their processes, getting to understand what is it that they want in the system. After all those workshops and hours and hours spending with the company, we went away and we did um, our documentation analysis. We looked at the security and the infrastructure and everything else. So you'll see that by the end of month six, we had a customer sign-off meeting. Now what we produced after six months of this project was a couple of lever arch files full of specification documentation. Now, if I'll show you later how the Agile projects have changed because once the customers finally read through all these lever arch <coughs> files and they signed off and they were happy, we went away again with our IT people and they started coding, developing, designing the screens, doing all those kind of things. And about 12 months later, we started rolling out the first module for this company. And over a period of six months, we did sort of uh, 
POC with the different modules in the different business units. And 18 months after they've signed the contract with us, they finally went live with this HR system. And as usual, they realized, oh, but legislation has changed. Now we need this information. Can we change this? Can we do that? Oh, we don't want this anymore. Or our recruitment process has changed. Can you change um, the system to... So over a period, since we signed the contract, after 18 months started implementing it, they really only started using this HR software after about 24 to 36 months. And this is how long it took to implement something that the client really wanted. We've learned from that in, in a way that with smaller clients, we said, first use the vanilla version, see what works, what doesn't work, and then we make changes. But still, it took us between 6 and 12 months to implement an, uh, a solution for our clients. And along the way, we have learned a lot of things. And when I joined clientele, I learned about Agile. And I'll tell you a bit more about Agile. A lot of people think that Agile means no documentation. Um, and in a way, we don't have five lever arch files for every project, but there are still documentation. Um, especially in the beginning when you're trying to understand what is it that the business want and what kind of features it is that they do want to deliver, there is still some documentation that needs to happen. So Agile is an adjective if you look at the dictionary, and it means to move quickly and easily, and ability to think quickly and in an intelligent way. As with my, f my first project that I did, to take, a, take three years to implement a system, by that time the business has changed, their needs have changed, the, the people want different things. So that was just too slow, um, especially for IT projects. Okay, so definition, Agile is a way to manage projects. As Agile realizes that projects are inherently unpredictable, it also embraces the unpredictability by breaking down projects into smaller chunks. And then the, this approach makes it easy to prioritize, add and drop features mid-project. Because sometimes you think this is what you want, but as, as your business change, you might have other priorities that are more important and then things that, that falls off that's, that you don't want anymore. Okay, just another defi definition. Agile project management is a style of project management that focuses on the early delivery of business value. It involves continuous improvement of the project's product, processes, scope flexibility, team input, and delivering well-tested products that reflect customer needs. And as we go through, I'll show you what the, but early delivery is, what, what, what are the features that a customer want now? Let's do it in this next two weeks and, and roll it out to the customer. Um, continuous improvement, on a two-weekly basis, we sit and say, what can we learn from the past sprint and how can we do things differently next time? And then also flexibility. Sometimes things change. All the, the business have new needs. Or there's a new project or new product that they launch. And they all of a sudden need something. They need something different than what they did two, two weeks ago. Okay, so this is just um, one of the Agile Samurai. It's quite a good book on Agile. And it's, it's an easy read for those of you who are maybe interested in reading more about it. So Agile is a way of developing software that reminds us that although computers run the code, it's people who create and maintain it. Agile is one of those behavioral things. It's the way you operate, the way you manage your people in your business. It's not just about sticking to processes and policies and doing what the project plan says. And then Agile is a framework, attitude, and approach to software delivery that is lean, fast, and pragmatic. So, and then Agile is no silver bullet. You can't fix everything with Agile. There are projects that Agile will never work for. Imagine you want to build a house and you contract with a a developer and he follows the agile approach um, you might get the door and then a couple of other things but at the end of the day you want to know within three months you're going to have a whole house and agile might not always work for all the kinds of projects have you ever worked on plans like that how often does the bottom one happen all the time, all the time. <laughs> and this is this is where agile comes in is when you get those curveballs you can just gather your team and you can change things and adapt to what, what you need. Have any of you worked on a plan like that, a project like that? And I, I see it often in IT. You've got, like I said, these files of specs, 
and then you've got three months to to do all these things and then hopefully a miracle will happen and we'll have something that that the customer can use but it doesn't always happen like that okay so what is agile you break big problems into smaller ones um, you'll see the use of the cards this is the format or the, the size that we use to write a user story so user story might be something like as a business um, owner or as a let's let's use an example of a, of a broker commission <coughs> system as the broker manager I want to be able to capture the broker applications online so that's the story and then what we do is we take that story and we break it down and what are the actual things that we need to do to deliver that to our business owner so you don't have files and files of specs but you might have a design you might have a physical application form to show you what are the fields that you require and that and then at the back end you might have an architectural drawing to say where do we get the information from and then from that there your team will take it and deliver that application form in a sprint okay, you focus on the really important stuff and forget everything else that especially with developers um they call it context context switching sometimes you they are so focused and if you just to disturb them with a meeting or something like that they just lose track and then you can't get them to focus again so what you're trying to do in an agile team is you get the guys to say this is our goal for the sprint and all you do needs to um, all you focus on needs to deliver on this output that we have to um, show business at the end of the two weeks as a scrum master it's my job to get all the disruptions away from the developers because they don't want to be drawn into meetings and asked to quickly fix this or quickly help with that. That's not what they focus on. They focus on is to deliver on whatever you've decided in the beginning of the sprint. That is what they need to do. You make sure what you deliver actually works. Um, quality is absolutely key in any project. So what we do with Agile projects, everybody's responsible for, uh, for quality. If you have an analyst on your team and that person doesn't get the right requirements guess what whatever the developers are going to code is not going to be um, quality then we do different things like pair coding where the guys sit together they decide on a solution and they code it together and then we also have code reviews so that by the time we show what we've done in the two weeks to our business owners we made sure that we tested it in every single step of the process Okay, and you ask for feedback often. So you don't just show your customer after six months what you've done. We have two-week sprints, but some companies do four-week sprints. So every two weeks we have a demo and we show, the, show our business customers, this is what we developed. Are you happy? And usually what happens when you show it, you get feedback or you understand that some of the requirements now change or something that they think they wanted now triggered something else that they actually want. So you can also add to your backlog list while you're getting feedback from your customers <laughs> and they also know what is happening in the project so when they get called into the CEO's office and say when are you going to deliver this um, commission system then they know exactly where we stand with the commission system what is happening and during the sprint and by what are we going to deliver at the end of the day and then you change course when necessary so for example we recently decided that one of our products, we want to start selling to a new channel. Um, the commission system that I'm working on has got certain rules and certain channels. And all of a sudden, we had to adapt because the business wanted to start selling this one product to a different channel. So we needed to accommodate for that um, for, uh, you know, as a matter of urgency because it, it was supposed to go live in a month's time. So it was just an opportunity that presented the business. We thought, well, we can start selling this product. And we obviously had to make sure that whatever we were planning to do for that next sprint, we had to change course so we could accommodate this business need. And then you become accountable. The fact that at the end of your two-week sprint, you have to go and stand in front of the customers and show them what you've done, it means that you are accountable. But it's not just the accountability of the development team. It's also the accountability of the customer because they all of a sudden realize they're also part of your team. If us as a development team fails the customer also fails because it might be that he didn't get back to us quickly enough with information or um, they didn't test the work that we asked them to test so it's important that 
because you can't, everybody knows what you're busy with and what you're working on, you are more accountable. So just a quick summary. Instead of just seeing this giant big project, you take small bite-sized pieces and you decide what you are going to work on for a specific sprint in order to deliver on your project. Okay, so how can we benefit from an agile pro approach? Continuous innovation. Um, because we have a feedback session every two weeks, we constantly think what will work better, what didn't work this week, how can we change it, and then next week we try something different. Um, so we continuously innovate. And also because these guys that work on the development teams, they are accountable for what they deliver, they always look for better technologies. And we are, we've got um, a couple of teams that work on operational systems, and those systems are old systems that they just need to maintain, to make fixes and things like that. But for example, on the roadmap team that I work on, we can innovate and we can look for new technologies because we're busy building the future for, for our business. So it helps um, the developers to actually look for better ways to do things. Improved time to market. As I said, we wanted to launch this product in the new channel and we literally took one sprint to develop the commission streams that was required to, to pay our brokers to sell this new, new product. Bjorn? <laughs> no, luckily not. <laughs> we try and stay away from those things. Did you have a crisis here in Bloemfontein with Black Friday? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we still, see, we're IT people, we shop online. So whether it's Black Friday or not, it doesn't really bother us. Okay, product adaptability. Once again, market needs change, your business requirements change. Fine, then let's change the plan and do something different next sprint. But at the end of the day, you still know that your roadmap is to deliver on a certain product, but you might just change the way you implement it and the, um, what, what is the priority. People and process adaptability. Um, in an agile team, your people should be able to deliver a product, but you might be able to pull in resources from other teams if they need something um, specific for, for a specific sprint. So you can always change things. And because people manage themselves, they can be quite flexible and they can, can adapt to, what the, to the requirements. And then reliable results. Like I said earlier, quality is key in every step of the process. And you get your customer feedback after your two-week sprint. Um, if customers are not happy, they're not going to keep quiet about it. And then you have to go and fix it. So it's, it gives you more reliable results. Okay, not just an IT thing. This comes out of a, it's a, um, a paper that was written by the Scrum Alliance and Forbes Insights. It is not specific to South Africa, but it's a global study with over a thousand companies. It's that they don't just use Agile in IT anymore. It's across different, different business units now. Okay, brief history. Like Dion said, it's, uh, Agile is not just a new concept. So it started off probably in the 1930s. I'm sure you've heard of the Plan, Do, um, Study, Act model, where people continuously look at how to improve their projects. Um, 1940s, Second World War, US government didn't have the luxury of um, time. They had to develop atomic bombs, so they got all the top scientists to sit together and to work on, on a solution. Then in terms of iterative in, uh, incremental development used by the US military um, to develop the X-15 hypersonic jet. Sorry, I said, and then managing the development of large software systems was published by Dr. Royce in the 1970s. 1986, um, Harvard Business Review published an article called The New New Product Development Game, and that was um, written by two Japanese scientists who did a lot of studies in operational work where they were talking about having smaller iterations and uh, smaller projects. Then in the 1990s, Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber created a time box approach based on blending of the, Jap the, the, the techniques that the J two Japanese gentlemen developed. Um, and they called it Scrum. Then in, um, in 2001, Jeff and Ken got together 17 different um, experts in Lean and Scrum, and they started talking about uh, um, Agile methods. From that conference, it's called the Uppsala Conference, is a whole definition for that. Um, the Scrum Alliance was formed, 
and shortly after that, the first Scrum book was published. And today, Scrum specifically is used by about 70% of people who are using Agile methodology. So, okay, Agile is a mindset, so it's not just processes. Um, they've got a manifesto and values, so it's just the way we do things. They've got certain principles, and then there are different practices or flavors of Agile. Okay, Agile manif manifesto. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. How often do you sit in a project and you just want to ask somebody something, but you need to log a call and that person will get back to you when they get to your call? And with Agile, you get up, you walk to the person, you ask your question. So, and engaging with your customers and making sure that you have a good relationship with the people that you deal with. Also, because your customers are part of your team, that it's not just an us and them situation because it's always, um, you know, oh, but business didn't do this or IT is not supporting us. Working software over comprehensive documentation, we spoke about it briefly. Instead of having lever arch files of specs, you make sure this is what customers wanted, is the software working? And that's more important than spending months and months typing out um, uh, documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. As I said, customers are part of your team. If they don't come to your stand-ups, you can't answer questions, it will delay your project. And I've worked on projects like that, where it was quite a new division. The business owners didn't know themselves what we had to do. It was new legislation, so half of the time they didn't show up for stand-ups. If we had a question, we had to go to them or send them an email, wait for them to respond, and often they would then send that email to one of the EXCO members because they didn't always have the answers. And that project was just delayed and drawn out tremendously. I work now on projects where customers, they attend our stand-ups, they attend our demos, and it's amazing how the speed has increased because all of a sudden, every morning, if you have a question, get the answer from the customer. Today we work on the problem, we, fix, and we have a solution. So definitely customer collaboration is important. And then responding to change over following a plan. Like I said, you might have this plan of what you are going to deliver, but something in the business changes, and then you just, just respond to that change. So and what they say is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So it's not like the things on the right doesn't matter. It still matters, but we value the things on the left more. Okay, 12 principles. Customer satisfaction through early and continuous software delivery. So instead of waiting 18 months to have an HR module, we try and deliver something con continuously. Often in the beginning of the project, you can't deliver everything on this every second week because there's a lot of back-end things that needs to happen and integrations with software. But once all these things are set up, you can start giving your customers features that they can start using immediately. Accommodating changing requirements throughout the development process. Yeah, sure, we've scoped all the features, but maybe there's something new that the customers want, or all of a sudden something that we scoped is not necessary anymore, so we take it off our list. And then frequent delivery of working software. Like I said, we try and deliver something after every sprint. Collaboration between the business stakeholders and developers through the project. We work <coughs> together as a team. Um, it's not the us and them. Support, trust, and motivate the people involved. And that is quite a tough one because IT people, they like to sit in their little corners and focus. And sometimes it's not always easy to, to motivate them, especially the two days before demo. They are so stressed out. You just put coffee down and you just walk away. But they're actually really awesome people. But because they constantly have to deliver, you need to make sure that you motivate them. And the feedback that they usually get after a demo is quite encouraging and motivating. So it's not just um, those demos where you, that you sit and be criticized. It's actually to get positive feedback from your customers. And we also coach our business users to say, you know, the way that you give your feedback is important. And then enable face-to-face -face interactions. Um, agile projects do work when you have teams in different countries, but what we would often do is have Skype stand-ups and you use technology more. But we find that productivity is 
higher when people do sit together and they have that face-to-face -face interactions. Okay, and then working software is the primary measure of progress. So it doesn't matter how beautiful your documentation is and how fancy you've done all these process flows, if the software doesn't work, it doesn't matter. So that, that is how we measure our success. Agile processes to support a consistent development phase. What often happens in projects is you will start working on the project and then like the month before it go live, everybody will work 20 hours days. Um, what happens with Agile, because you constantly deliver and before the, you, uh, you decide on what you're going to do, you say, what is our capacity for this week? Oh, the, we're going to have two people on leave. So then what we bring into that sprint is the things that we can deal with for that, um, for, for, for that work period. So instead of setting up your team for failure, you make sure that you, you change, when you do your planning, you adjust to what, what is possible for specific work. And it's, sometimes it happens that you misjudged a user story and you think, oh, this is going to take us two days to deliver, and then it takes five days because all of a sudden we realize we don't have specific um, information or we don't have the integration, or all of a sudden in, we thought that we can get all the billings information from the billing system, but meantime there's some information in the data warehouse and there's other information. It, it happens, but then you just adjust your plan and you, you work with that. <coughs> Attention to technical detail and designs uh, enhance agility. Once again, because we do peer coding, because the, we do code reviews, it's important that we make sure that the technical detail is correct because that is what makes your software work. Simplicity, like I said, not lots of documentation. Keep it simple. What is it that we need to deliver? Let's focus, focus on what we need to deliver. And what we also tell is the bells and whistles we can do, but let's first get the functionality right. Let's make sure that this bicycle can ride before we put all the other fancy things on. And then self-organizing teams encourage great architecture, requirements and designs. <coughs> IHL teams are self-organizing, so um, although we do have line managers, in the team you decide, this is the work we have to do, how are we going to do it? Today I want to just focus on this, I'm going to work from home and it's fine for the people. Also what happens is, because they know they need to deliver in two <coughs> weeks time, they say, what is the best solution to this problem? So instead of just following a set of rules to say, oh, we have to use this software, we have to use this methodology, as the team that decide what is the best solution um, to, to a specific um, problem. And then regular reflections on how to become more effective. At the end of the two weeks, we sit together as a team and we say, what didn't work and how are we going to do it differently? Or what are the new habits we need to adopt in our team? Agile world, so like I said, Agile is not just Agile, there's Dion. Yeah, sure, of course. So, um, my first question is, in, in clientele in your, mm. in your immediate environment, um, the resources on your project, are they project-dedicated resources, or do you have organizational resources that you share with the organization? So, it depends on the project. So, we've got a... Oh. Um, on the roadmap team, which is my team, we just do the new technologies in order to get us off the old stuff. So there I've got specific guys that are dedicated to the team who's just going to develop that. Um, the business owners are different people because we do work on, for example, we work on a commissions project, we work on a billings project. So within the business people we pull in, but they're not full-time dedicated to that. Then we have a product team. Now the product team will be the guys who are implementing new products. And for a specific project, they will pull in different people for their business. Um, for example, I may be sitting on a project team or a product project team for a certain uh, product stream that they're working on, and we will attend project meetings for that. So they are still a little bit more waterfall than agile. Then in the IT department, we also have more operational teams. So those are the guys who work specifically on the old technology. So we've got a team for finance, we have a team for admin, we've got a team for sales. Um, the business analysts and the developers are, are dedicated and they serve a specific business customer base. Um, so, like, uh, so they're different teams for different things and we are still on this journey. We're not 100% agile yet and I think um, I, I've got the opportunity in my team because it's new technology 
that, that I can be more agile than some of the other project teams who, who still rely on old systems or just bug fixes most of the time. Um, so, I don't know, does that answer your question? Yes, because it leads to the next question is you, you often have to take people out of the business yes. to come and attend project meetings yes. and it's frequent, like you say, every two weeks, etc. And how do you manage, what's your experience? Is business um, open to bring the resources up to attend this meeting? How, how do you manage that culture change? Yeah, so, I think clientele has always been quite an innovative company. They have this way of just bringing things to market in, in a very short period of time. So, for example, we just launched the clientele rewards, which is sort of a coupons um, that we give to our customers. And then that went hand in hand with our app um, that we launched as well. Now, for that specific project, we obviously had marketing people involved. We needed compliance involved. We um, so, so we pulled people out for that special project. And then on the IT side, we needed people across different um, systems as well. Because, um, for example, we need to, you can get your coupon once you've paid your policy. So we needed people from Billings team to make sure that that information gets pulled through to, to, to the coupon. Then we had to involve our app team to develop the functionality that if you don't want to use the actual coupon booklet, to have an online app um, um, coupon. And then, so, so for, for that, the, we, we pulled in different resources and those kind of projects, we still run more like an agile, uh, no, like a waterfall project, and that's mainly managed by our product team. But it does take extra strain. What I do as a Scrum Master, I keep the noise away from my, from my development team. So I will know this is what we need to deliver, but we, I don't stress them out about it. We talk about it in our sprint planning session. So guys, uh, there's a new requirement for, for the coupons project. Please, um, can we add this to the sprint? So, so sort of blending the two approaches and just making sure that we manage the resources, um, if that makes sense. My last question is, um, you made it sound so simple when you say scope changes are better accommodated, etc. Mm. But, but we also know in real life that scope changes is, is a shock to the system yes. in, in most instances. So in your agile environment, do you still follow the formal scope change process um, of requesting it, speaking it, understanding the implications? Is it still a formal process or is it a lot more agile? Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll talk about the different agile ways of how do we manage that. But basically what happens with a scope change is there's a new requirement. We add it on our product backlog. Then we try when we do our planning session we understand how urgent is this if it's urgent we um we then add it to our next sprint and then the guys work on that because that will become their sprint goal if it is something that cannot wait for example something that we need to do now we say okay fine this is what we've already planned for our sprint what is it that we're going to take out to accommodate this new requirement because your capacity and your time is not going to change. You've got your two weeks, you've got three or five guys that work on your team. Um, so what is it that needs to give to put in this urgent request? And it's, uh, it, it also depends on how, how well it's scoped. So you don't need lots of documentation. It might be just one quick fix. But give us enough information so the guys can pick up the work and, and address it quickly. So and once again, this is where the business owners come in. Because at the end of the day, they, they own this list. Um, it's not IT that decides it can't be done because um, coming from working with IT teams, I know the favorite word is like compliance. It's just, no, we can't do it. Um, but with Agile, I say, yeah, sure, we can do it, but what are we taking out? Any other questions? So we basically say, our sprint goal was this. This is what we were planning to do. Unfortunately, something else came in that was very urgent, so we took some things out. And we don't, whatever we take out, we don't throw out, we just take it back to our backlog list because we need to still do it. Any other questions? So the question, what is the stand-up? The stand-up, so I'll get there, but uh, it's one of the scrum ceremonies. So we sit, we, we get together every morning for 15 minutes, and the reason why it's called the stand-up is because we don't sit down. Um, but it's just to make sure that people are focused, they stick to the time, they give us updates and then they can go, go, go and do their work. So we'll, we'll talk about the stand-ups and everything later. Your lists to do doing down in your backlog list, do you do them in electronic format or do you find all of them in electronic 
Well, we've got two ways. We start, I think when you start on an agile journey, it's good to do it on a whiteboard because it's, there's some psychological thing of taking a card and, and removing it. Um, it's just, the, the, and you feel like you're achieving it. We um, have got Asana, which is sort of a board that we're using, but what we are going to do, um, we're moving over to TFS. So TFS is a d another system, but the guys are also using it for the code reviews to do testing and to check it in. So you'll basically have a card, like a card with your user story and your tasks on, but with that you'll also have your code reviews and you can go and see. So if somebody leaves the company, you can go to that specific task, look at what code was written and just fix it there. And then you also link your automatic testing to that so that once you check in your code, the automatic testing run at night and then tomorrow morning you can deploy if, if there were no errors or make your fixes. So we, and, and it also depends. Some of the, you get some teams that are less mature in the agile and they're still finding their feet. They prefer the whiteboards. Um, other guys, especially the younger generation, they like working from home. It's cool to have the online board so I can see what they're busy with during the day. Because as soon as somebody moves a task, I get an update and say, this guy is working on this task. Um, and I'll show you some examples of the, of the boards later. But we also put our sizing there um, to say, this is how long it will take to, to finish this task. And that's how you can start measuring and reporting on what you've been working on and what you've completed. Any other questions? Okay, um, all right, reality about IT projects is it's impossible to gather all the requirements at the beginning of a project. You all know that business thinks this is what they want and then halfway through the project they realize, oh, but they also want 50 other things. Whatever requirements you do gather are guaranteed to change. And then there will always be more to do than time and money will allow. Okay, so remember this project? I told you about in the beginning. So this is how my projects have changed. Um, we've got, instead of the time and months that I had there in the beginning, we now have time and weeks. For every two-week sprint, we do planning, analyzing, developing, and testing. As a team, we work together and say, this is our goal, this is what we're going to work on, and we all get together, and this is what we focus on for the two weeks. We get customer feedback at the end of the two weeks, and we might even deploy um, new functionality every two weeks. It's just to give you an idea of how the our project plans have changed. Okay. Any questions? Sorry, I forgot to, to move my task cards. So what I would have done is I would have moved introduction. All right, any questions from anybody? One of the slides you mentioned that in Asia everyone is responsible for quality. Mm -hmm. So I just want to check if you are the Scrum Master and maybe you've got an experienced team members in the project, how do you ensure that the quality is up to scratch so that when you deliver the product or a piece of the progress to a customer? Yeah. So what we do is quality, we check at every step. So if you have a business anal analyst, for example, who doesn't do quality requirements, then whatever f happens in the next step, it's not going to happen. So you need to find out where, where is your bottleneck or where, it, where, where are things breaking and then help that person or coach that person. Now, if I'm not a developer. I cannot help our developers to do better code. But what we do on the development teams is we often do pair coding. So the guys sit together and they, they work out the solution together. And we also do code reviews. So we might, you might be writing the code and then your friend will check the code, um, just make sure that the code is right. We also often involve our architect to help us with design. Because if your design is wrong, you might put a lot of sluggishness in your system or just not find the best solution. So you pull your resources and you also help your resources. And the best way to learn is if you do work with other people. Um, of, uh, we've got quite a lot of systems in our company and unfortunately we have single man dependencies as well where there's one person who knows to how to support a system. Now that is 
that is a huge risk for our business. But we are busy getting junior people in that are getting trained by the more senior developers. On the roadmap team specifically, we work with new technologies. And I'm privileged that I have mostly just senior developers. These guys, but, but the reality is, even though you are fantastic at writing code, it still gets time to get to know a business. So you can't just employ somebody today and tomorrow is writing fantastic code because you need to understand how the business works, understand what kind of integrations you need to, to get, where to get what information from. So it is a constant process of coaching people and helping them to write better code. What we also do at the end of a sprint, we have a sprint retrospective where we say what's working, what's not working, what can we do better. And this is usually where we say, oh, but <coughs> maybe we need a tester. And then I can go to management and say, guys, you know what, we're the roadmap team and we don't have a tester. We're really at a point now where we need somebody to come and help us and do testing. Um, or they say, you know, what, whatever feedback we get, we try and implement it and try and um, constantly improve the quality of, of the work that we do. And sometimes it's not just the way that we code, but it's also the way we talk to people, the way we engage with people, or the speed at which we get information from customers. So it can be any kind of feedback that will make this, the, the process better. Does that answer your question? So, so would you say to your idea as a strong master, if you are implementing an AI project, what is the experience to the team other than the head of the You know what? I, 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 I've learned that sometimes you will never be there. Uh, I mean, I've. I've learned quite a lot of things, but I still think there's so much that I more need to learn more. So I could not expect somebody to just know everything and work on my team. We're all going to learn new things. Um, but it's encouraging people to go and find out and to go and get the information. Doesn't, um, I mean, you guys see how the world is changing. All of a sudden, people who thought they had a job for life realize that but co computers are taking over the work or robots are taking So you need to constantly make sure that you learn new things and, and in, uh, reinvent yourself almost. Um, so it's, it's good to have senior people on your team, but you also need to give other people an opportunity. And often what, I learn, what I've learned with IT people, these guys are absolutely brilliant. Most of them uh, in our business don't have formal IT qualifications, but they literally taught themselves by writing apps and sitting on YouTube every night and every weekend and figuring out things Half of them probably earn a lot more money outside developing things that, I don't know, it's probably going to change the world tomorrow than what they actually earn. So, it's, but it's just the mindset of constantly learning and, and, and doing new things. Does that answer your question? So, yeah, you do need a mix, but we all, and, and the other thing that I want to say is you sometimes get an 18-year-old who actually teach the 35-year-old developers things that they didn't know. So, it's not always about experience or age. It's just about knowing that you need to figure out um, what is the solution to this problem. Because we often get presented with problems and we need to figure it out. And I suppose it's the role of this, the Scrum Master to lead the team properly. Yes. To make sure that you integrate all the different uh, departments or sections yeah. in the business that all the team members have sufficient context. Yes. And yeah. I suppose also to, to manage the personalities. Yeah during all of these uh, contact sessions. Yeah, it is. And, and sometimes you find that a, a, a team member, he might be r brilliant, but it just doesn't work with the rest of your team. Because he thinks he's so good, um, he doesn't want to help other people. Or, and uh, I've had, unfortunately, the, 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 the experience where I had to go and ask for him to be moved to another team, because he wasn't good for the morale of the rest of the team. Although he was very good at what he did, because of that ego thing, he actually completely um, made everybody else demotivated. So, so you're, it's almost taking away that, that and just encouraging your team to be better. Think about a scrum master in rugby. You need to constantly encourage the guys and taking those obstacles away so that they can move together as a team. Um, because if they don't move together as a team, you are going to have people who hold you back or make sure that you always go two steps back. Any other questions? The scrum. Is the scrum master is keeping the distractions away from the team?
Okay, so just quick, more history. I know it's very boring and I've gone over my 18 minutes long time ago. So remember I told you about the two Japanese guys who, who wrote this HBR article about the new new project management? And then we had that Uppsala conference um, where they decided that they're going to talk about the Agile methodologies. The Agile software development with Scrum book was published in 1995. And then Scrum Alliance was founded. And then the first Scrum Master Education had started happening in 2003. And then today, Scrum is the most popular Agile methodology. So just one of the ways that people um, implement Agile. Okay, Scrum is a management framework within which complex products can be developed, uh, derived from knowledge management, complex adaptive systems, and empirical process control theory. So just and then the three pillars is transparency, inspection, and adaptation. Because we have these boards, people know exactly what we're working on, what are we delivering. We show them every two weeks, transparency is there. Inspection, customers can have a look at the products. We constantly make sure that we test. And then adaptation, if um, requirements change, we change. And also, if something didn't work this sprint and we need to change the way we work together, we adapt and we try something new for the next sprint. Okay, so Scrum is an adaptive, iterative, fast, flexible, effective framework. Like I said, it happens in two week sprints, it happens fast, and every two weeks you try and deliver something new. It's designed to deliver significant value quickly and throughout the project. You try and deliver every two weeks, or if you decide to have a four week sprint, you deliver every four weeks, instead of my 18 month project where I um, only started going live with some of the modules after 18 months. And then designed to ensure transparency in communication. Because this board is up, anybody can see what you're busy working on. And what we find is that if people don't size their task properly, they, it seems like there's a bottleneck in the system. So what we are, are encouraging our teams to do is to make sure that their tasks are never longer than half a day to one day. So that every morning they can at least move the car to the next, to the done column. If this car doesn't move, I need to know that there's a bottleneck somewhere or something is not, uh, not right here. And that's, that's the job of a scrum master to start looking for those patterns and finding out why these tasks are not moving and how can I help my team to actually move forward and do what they're supposed to do. Successful in an environment of collective accountability and continuous progress. Everybody's accountable. If business doesn't give us the information and we can't do our task, um, we fail as a team. Um, if, for example, as a business analyst, I didn't get the right requirements or the developers didn't test the code before they deployed, we're all accountable. And then a framework that uses cross-functional, self-organized and empowered teams to divide their work into short, concentrated work cycles called sprints. Got a small team got different skills on that team. We decide this is the goal for the sprint. And as the, the team together decide, how are we going to organize this work? How are we going to do it? And how are we going to deliver on the next sprint? So you don't have a manager that tells you, oh, these are your tasks for the week. As a team, we decide this is what we can achieve in two weeks. And then we decide together how we're going to do it. Okay, And then just Ken Schwaber is one of the founding fathers of Scrum. He says Scrum is like chess. If you learn the rules, if you understand the players, you can play the chess. And same with Scrum. There's not specific things to do every day. You just need to understand how the methodology works. Characteristics of Scrum. Project is divided in small logical chunks. Remember those two-week sprints? Those are your logical chunks. And you decide what, is, what makes sense to do together. Because um, often when you sit with a big project plan, you have to do, look at your dependencies. Here it's just, what, what, what can we do together to deliver something of value? Execution happens in short iterations or sprints, those two-week sprints that we spoke about. Um, they time box and has clear goals. So as a team, I know I've got two weeks. Usually we count it as nine days because um, I'll show you what our two weeks look like because the one day we sit in a demo meeting re, uh, and planning meeting. So that day's out for our team. In those nine days, let's say we've got three people, one guy's on leave. What is our capacity for this, for this two days? And then based on how, uh, how many work hours we'll have, we say this is what we can achieve in the two weeks. Um, we do build a little bit of fat in because people have to sit in meetings, people get sick, things do happen. 
but we try and not set our team up for failure from the start. We just say, what makes sense for this sprint? Yeah? So what's the size of a typical project team or a scrum mm. team um, in your environment? And do you have uh, project members that are not part of the scrum? So they just get information, etc. Yeah, so ideally theory sets between seven and nine members. Our teams are much smaller than that. For example, on the broker commission project, I am the scrum master and the BA and I have two developers working with me. On the billing system, I've got, I'm also the BA there, and I've got three developers. So it's, it's very, very small teams. Sometimes we will pull in guys from um, IT services to help us with setting up servers, but those are not permanent members of the team. They just help us if we need, need a new server, we need a new database, or for example, we might pull in a guy for one sprint to do UI design for us. Um, so those are non-permanent members of, of the teams. Some of our smaller operational teams also have about two developers, one BA, and in our environment, the Scrum Master also doubles up as the BA. So and it, it is not an ideal situation, but because we're still on this journey, it is something that we are looking at, um, and, and, and it is a bit of a bottleneck, because often you're so busy organizing Scrum Master things that you can't do the analysis. Um, so that, that, for example, is one of the things that we are working on. Or you're just spending all your time with the customers and you can't, can't look after your, your scrum team and, and take their distractions away from them. But because it's a cross-functional team, we sometimes have a developer that will quickly go and get um, requirements from, from business because it's just easier for them to understand what business wants than using your um, analyst. Or you might have a tester. Some of the oldest, oldest systems or project teams, they also all have testers on the team. I've got a, um, I don't have a tester. So as a developer, our de we, we do our own testing in our team. So, so you're looking at one tester, one BA slash Scrum Master, and about two, two developers per team in our business. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Self-organizing teams, as I explained, the guys decide how we're going to do this work and they just get it done. Nobody checks up on them. Um, if somebody comes in late and leaves early, the team sorts it out. It's, it's absolutely incredible when you're all accountable to deliver something at the end of the two weeks and somebody doesn't pull weight. Um, the, the rest of the team members actually do sort, sort that out. Requirements are captured as items in a list or the product backlog. Like I said, on those little cards, we put it on the product backlog. And when we do our sprint planning, we decide what is the goal for the sprint, and we start taking those tasks off our, of our requirements list. And then no specific engineering practice are prescribed for Scrum. They say Scrum does work very well with um, extreme programming, but it's not necessarily prescribed for that. And then operates in an agile environment for delivering projects. Okay, so lots of companies using Scrum. As I said, it's about 70% of companies who are agile do use the Scrum um, methodology. And then this is just a quote from how Apple does it, where they actually talk about deep collaboration or cross-pollination or concurrent engineering, where they, as a team, work on things. So they don't do something and then hand it over to the next team. The team that produces the product, whether it's the iPod or whatever, they actually do it all in one, one product team. Okay, then Scrum consists of values, principles, roles, ceremonies, and artifacts. And this is where I'll start talking about stand-ups and, and all the other things. Values, courage. It does take courage to work on a Scrum team. Um, like I said earlier, sometimes you have your senior developers and the junior guys are too scared to stand up and say, oh no, but your code is wrong. But it's just something that you constantly need to work on to say, guys, you need to have this courage. And sometimes you have to tell business, we're not going to do this, or it doesn't make sense to do this now. We, we have a culture um, in the past where we always had to rush things and have workarounds because we need to go live with something. Um, my team, I told them, we do not do quick fixes. If we can't do something properly, we're not doing it. And did take some time, but business respects that because they're also tired of having all these funny manual processes on the side because the system can't do what it's supposed to do. Um, so sometimes you do have to wait longer, but you actually are going to get a better quality work. 
And, but that does take courage. Um, focus, everyone focuses on the work that needs to happen. We say this is the goal for the sprint and whatever other distractions are there, we're not touching it. If the CEO walks in and he wants something done, that's fine. Please come to the sprint planning on Friday and if the business owners agree that that requirement is important, we all add it to, to the next sprint. Commitment, people need to work together, they need to be committed. If people are not engaged, you will see that in what they deliver. Um, and like I said, the team will, will eventually sort it out and those people eventually do leave if they're not committed to, to working that way. Respect, you have to respect each other. You can't just shout instructions to your developers and expect them to, to perform you, the way that you work together. And also, these guys are knowledge workers. You need to respect them for what they know and the decisions that they make because sometimes it's very difficult um, things that they need to find a solution to and um, if you respect their knowledge, they will make sure that they make the right, right decision. And then openness, everybody knows what you're busy working on. If you take too long on a task, then obviously something's wrong. So you need to, to, to discuss those things. So it's important to be open in your Scrum teams. Scrum principles, empirical process control, you show what you're busy doing with, you inspect it, and then if something doesn't work, you adapt it. So spoke about that. Self-organizing teams, we spoke about that as well. The teams decide what needs to happen and how, how it needs to happen. Collaboration, not just in your team, but also with the rest of business. It's important for everybody to work together. Um, Value-based prioritization, you've got this long list of things that need to happen. What will add the most value and you prioritize it to that. Um, I've heard that, I think it's the guy who did the the logistics system for Walmart, he said that a big project should never take more, more, more than six months. If you take longer than six months to, de to develop a new project, it means that you've added too many bells and whistles in the beginning. You need to just put in your features list what you really need in your project. So what is the priority? What is it that the system actually needs to do? Time boxed, I'll show you. We've got two week sprints. We've got specific meetings. Those meetings have got specific time frames that you don't waste time in sitting in meetings for the sake of meetings. We have 15 minutes every morning for our stand-up, discuss what we need to discuss, and then we have to go and work. So time boxing is, is critical with that. And then iterative development. So you might just have an application form that you've developed for your broker team now, and then all of a sudden you, compliance says, oh, but it would be nice if we can add our signed contract to this application form. So then we go back to that and we add that functionality. So it's iterative development in terms of adding functionality as the business requires it. Okay, Scrum Framework, this is your two-week sprint. As I said in the beginning, you've got your, all your tasks happening in every sprint. Um, so it's not uh, upfront scoping and documentation and then only you start. So in every sprint, there's some planning, analyzing, developing, testing. And then you've got specific roles, you've got specific ceremonies or meetings that we spoke about. And then also your artifacts, which is your product list and those kind of things. Okay, roles, three main roles, your product owner, your scrum master, and your development team. And I'll go through this uh, in a bit more detail. Your ceremonies are your sprint planning, your sprint review, sprint retrospective, and your daily scrum or your stand-up. And then artifacts, product backlog, sprint backlog, and task cards. Any questions? Do you guys want to have a leg stretch? Okay. No, that's great. Then we can move on. How much time are you going to require? Um, oh, another two hours, I think. <laughs> no. In no, that case? <laughs> no, it's probably another 40 minutes, I think. You good? Yeah, let's continue. All right, meet the team. Okay. As I said, agile teams are quite a different breed. So I want to show you a video just to show you what kind of people I deal with on a daily day, daily basis. I do love them to bits, but they are very quirky and they have very interesting personalities. I got here as quickly as I could. You're too late. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. 
Sheldon, this is silly. You got emotional when that lab monkey died. <laughs> that lab monkey told me he loved me in sign language. <laughs> song in my head all day. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss, but I think I have something that might make you feel better. I got you a new computer! How could you do that? <laughs> do what? Choosing a new laptop is an incredibly personal ritual. You have taken away weeks of agonizing thought, tedious research, sleepless nights filled with indecision. I just... Today? <laughs> well, the guy at the store said this one is great. Oh, oh the guy. Oh, pardon me. Uh, I, I didn't realize you'd spoken to the guy. You, you, tell me, did the guy choose one with a 4K display and a Thunderbolt port? Yes. Yeah? Well, did, did the guy make sure that this has a one terabyte solid state drive? Yes. Yo, well, was this guy Rick from Computer Solutions on Colorado? Yes. Yeah, well, he does know his stuff. Do you guys know people like that? Okay. So, all right. And yet, among all the chaos, confusion, and lack of formal hierarchy, high-performing agile teams somehow seem to really produce quality software. I mean, the first time I heard of Agile, I also thought, oh my hat, this is never going to work. How can you just give people stuff and they just decide how to do it? But it actually does work, so it is, it is quite in incredible. I mean, Scrum teams are a different breed. On a typical Agile project, there are no predefined roles, and in theory, anyone can do anything. Because you have people, they grab a task and say, oh, I know how to do this. They move it on their name, and then they just do it. So it's not like you've got a lead developer and he decides who, need, who does what. People just decide they're going to do that and it, it works. Okay, so people do still have their core responsibilities, their core skills, um, but there's no hierarchy um, and this is how they make it work. But the most important thing is that they have to work together. They need to all understand what are we working towards and they sort of have to be joined by the hip like the, the quotes say. Um, and then people, uh, you know, so this is just, Agile is a big on the concept of one team and team accountability. So this, this becomes obviously, you know, decentralized teams becomes more complex. Yes. And, and what happened to us in the past, so for example, before we moved more towards Agile, we had a point system where people would um, say, these are the points that we're going to work on for the quarter and business would get together in a big um, prioritization meeting and they would all fight for certain points. Now what was great is that our productivity skyrocketed because our performance management was linked to how many points of work you would have done for, for that specific quarter. The problem is that teamwork just collapsed because all of a sudden everybody just wanted to do their own points and they didn't care about you know anything else because their bonuses depended on it. So it is, it is finding something that will work for your organization, but also supporting your people to be able to implement it. Okay, so what makes an agile team tick? Oh, that one went a bit too quickly. Um, Co-location. Okay, I'm really too fast with this thing. Oh, man. Oh, it's too slow for me. Okay, I'll just stick there. Co-location. Your team has to sit together. We've got a big open plan office, and not everybody sits together. Um, I'll show you some photos now. Our um, app team actually sits in the basement. So we converted the basement. We painted the walls quite bright. They initially called it the creche, but now they just call it the dungeon. But it works for them, and this is where they all sit. They get together and work together. Um, I'm lucky that the roadmap team has got a, a, um, sort of a boardroom that they converted for us, and we can also all sit together. Some of the other teams are dispersed because the testers are all sitting together. So if you want something from the tester, you need to go and ask the tester to do it. But we are busy moving the teams so that they can actually sit together. Um, engage customers. Like I said, I've worked on a project where the customers even, didn't even know what they wanted. They didn't show up for our meetings. 
and it took us very, very long to actually get um, work done on this project. Now I've got customers who come to my stand-ups every morning, they give feedback. If they promise that they'll taste something, they'll taste it and they'll give us feedback. And this project actually moves so much quicker because our customers are part of our team. Self-organizing, we spoke about this. Um, the team decides what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Accountable and empowered, because you need to deliver at the end of your two weeks, you have to be accountable. But it's no use having an accountability if you're not empowered to make decisions. And that's also some of, the, some of our teams are not there yet because they still feel that somebody needs to tell them what to do. But if you have mature people who can say, okay, fine, we can make this decision and we stand by our decision. And often we'll have our CIO or architect questioning them, why have you decided on this route? But if they've made a decision, they will stand by it and they say, this is why, it, why we've done that. And then cross-functional, you need different skills in your team. You can't just all have app developers if you're working on, on, on different systems. Okay, so Scrum consists of people who know what needs to be built. So those are your customers or your product owners and the people who can build it. And that's your development team. Development team consists out of analysts, developers, UI designers, whatever it takes to deliver a specific project. And then Agile is less concerned about who plays what role and more worried about the right roles being played. So when you do decide on what team you want, make sure that you've got all the skills that you require to deliver a specific project. So you've got your product owner, which is your customer, your customer representative, your scrum master, and then your development team. That's your roles in your, in your project. Okay, like I said, your development team is all part of that, and then your stakeholders can be anybody else in business or whoever you're developing this product for. Okay, as the project owner, I represent the customer, and I need to know what, what to build. So the product owner will tell us, this is the functionality I need. Um, as I said, we're starting on the new billings project, so I sit with the billings manager, and I said, what is the functionality that you want in the system? And then he will say, oh, but the system needs to do this, the system needs to do that. He doesn't have to know how to specify technically. He just needs to tell me what is it that he wants as a customer. Um, so his primary job is to take care of the business side of the project. Um, and he will then manage the stakeholders and so on. Um, so he shares the vision of the product. And then he's also responsible for the product backlog list. So he will say these are the items. and it's usually the product owner that will tell you what is priority. What is it that I want the team to work on for the next sprint? So you always have to work together. Some companies have a product owner sitting with the development team. Unfortunately, our product owners also still have real jobs and they have to run their own departments. So they will usually just attend our scrum meetings and then give us guidance when we do analysis. I'm not going to go through all of this because I can see you guys are falling asleep. <laughs> development team, so we cross-functional group of people who can take the customer's requirements and turn it into working so software. So analysts, developers, testers, whatever it takes to, to build something specific for the customer. Mm. Mm. With your development team, say you have two semi-identical teams who share the same basic level of skill. How much of a disruption does it cause? Like almost they are cross-functional. How much of a disruption does it cause to take team members from one team and move them to the other during uh, a sprint or an entirety of the project? Yeah, so you wouldn't do that during a sprint. Um, if you have to move somebody, it will, you'll need to have a very good business reason. So, for example, we had a guy who resigned, and the guy was best qualified, was actually part of my team. So they moved him to this team to do sort of a takeover. And it did dis disrupt our team because all of a sudden, um, we had one member less and we had to make do with all the work. So you can't do it in a sprint because otherwise you have to take some of the work out. Um, and also for people's personalities to gel again, you know, you need to get used to the new work and especially with development, it's context switching. I think if it's the new technology, the same technology, it's easy, but if you move between technologies, then it, it does get difficult. And it, it's also stressful for de developers to, to, to move from product to product. Um, so, yeah, so I wouldn't move them in a sprint, and ideally I wouldn't um, really move them during a product. But like I said, you move from roadmap team to operational team, and operational team just do basic fixes and things like that. Um, and sometimes, you know, especially with developers, it's also an ego thing. 
Um, I always say that you know the best guys work on the roadmap team because those are the guys who deliver the new technology. So when you all of a sudden move from a roadmap team to an to an operational team, it's you know you, you don't, you're not always happy with it. But unfortunately, we had a business requirement and we we couldn't just let that team not have a developer. Um, so yeah, it is quite disrupting. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So. Development team, like we spoke about it over and over, they they make make it happen and they decide what to do, how they're going to do it, and also how long it will take to do the work. And they're responsible for tracking progress as well. Scrum master, so my responsibility is to safeguard the Scrum process. So I make sure that I facilitate the processes. I do all the organizing. I need to protect the team. So if there's any noise or somebody wants something, I try and keep them away from the team. We often have, we know about new things happening, and um, I've got a brilliant developer on my team, but he stresses <coughs> because he starts thinking about what, how, what he needs to do next sprint and things that's not in place yet. So I try and keep that noise away from him and only get him to focus on what we have to do now. And then when it's time to introduce the new things that we have to happen, and then he's got time to think about it and plan it, because otherwise it completely distracts him. Um, and then also, I keep the team focused on the sprint goal. So I always say, guys, this is what we agreed with our product owner. We have to deliver this in two weeks' time. Is what you want to do now going to help us to, to deliver on that sprint goal? Okay, so I just ensure that everyone in the team understands the goals of the sprint. I remove the obstacles. And they say the Scrum Master is sort of the Switzerland of the Scrum process. You need to stay between business and the development team, make sure everybody Everybody's happy. And okay, so our teams at clientele. So, like I said, we, and I've, I've, I've explained this before. So, we've got our different kinds of teams, and they're all different pla places in the journey. We've got operational teams that just support the day to day business. Um, and then, roadmap is all our strategic projects. We've got dual roles, like I said, Scrum Master and Business Analyst. That's also not ideal. Um, I went on a Scrum Master training, and they always said, a good Scrum Master has got two projects, but a brilliant one has got one project. Um, unfortunately, we've got other things that we have to do. Um, and then every team has its own personality. And that we've seen, they've got their own way of doing things. Um, so, so teams are just different. They just have a different way of, of, of approaching their work as well. And then our teams are on different stages of adoption. Like I said, some people are still on the boards. Other people are completely resistant against it. But what we are achieving is to show the results and to show how easy it is to work with business when you can deliver every two weeks. Because business all of a sudden starts trusting you. You say, okay, you know what? We just need to step away. They will actually do what they are supposed to do. Um, that's our app team. They sit in the dungeon with those brightly colored walls. Um, you can see there at the back all those posters and post-it notes. Those are their, their boards and their actual requirements. Um, and then you'll see they're all sitting around the table, no um, blockages, and they can constantly talk and, and discuss, discuss the work. Um, scrum ceremonies. So those are the meetings that we have in a scrum process. Um, So, so we work all um, business um, so software solutions, which is our IT department. Um, we've got a, a CIO, we've got an Exco, and then we've got a development manager who basically looks after all the developers, and then we've got a, a BA manager who looks after all the BAs and the testers. Then the teams, um, those teams are split across the business. So, so we all sit in one big open plan. Um, roadmap team works on the strategic projects, and my product owner is actually the CIO because it's a sort of baby to look to make sure that we get onto the new technology for, for the business. Um, the other teams, like I said, we've got a finance team, we've got a product team. They all um, sit, they have their own little um, project teams, but they, their product owners are the different department heads. 
So they still report to the development manager or the BA manager, but they do the work for the different department. We have another team called product, but they sit outside of IT because they coordinate all the new things that we are going to bring into the business. I have been talking to our COO. They are thinking of getting a strategic projects office where that office will just implement um, whatever new strategy will come along. So it's not going to be necessarily IT specific and they want to do it almost in an agile, agile way but pull in people from the business for, for the different projects. It's sort of, like I said, that's not been implemented yet but that is the plan. Um, so we mainly work for IT and then um, we've got the product team who actually just uh, implements new products and design new products. Any other questions? Okay, the scrum ceremonies are meetings. We've got a couple of meetings that we have. Unfortunately, we have to attend meetings. Um, but they are time boxed. And we don't just have meetings for the sake of meetings because often you have, oh, it's a project feedback meeting, but nobody's got feedback to give, so we still have to have the meeting. Um, so the whole idea of scrum meetings is to get work done in a structured manner. We set expectations so we know the purpose for this meeting is that and this is what we do every time we meet. Um, we empower the team to collaborate effectively because the team can see the business owners, we can ask questions and also drive results because we know at every meeting we have to give feedback or we have to show what we've delivered. So we've got the types of meetings, you've got a planning meeting, so every two weeks we look at our product backlog, we say okay these are the things that we, this is our goal for the next um, sprint and then we take the tasks that will help us to deliver on that goal during this planning meeting. The guys will then sit and they will draw out diagrams and they will look at solutions and then they take those tasks and they start sizing the task. So com comparing to say, okay, well this task will take half a day, this is one day task. And that, whatever comes out of that sprint planning meeting goes into our sprint backlog for the next, for the next two weeks. We've got a daily stand-up, so every day, 15 minutes in the morning, we get together as a team, business owners are invited, and all we do in that meeting is to say, what did we do yesterday, what are we working on today, and are there any blockers? What, what's, what's stopping me from, from doing my work? Sometimes there's a question, and the guys want to discuss things in more detail, and that's when we go into what we call a sprint after party, where the guys actually d just work together and find a solution to a problem. And this is usually business leaves or business stay if they want to give input on that. <coughs> and then at the end of the two weeks, we've got a sprint review meeting. Um, we show business what have we done for the past two weeks. We get feedback from them. Sometimes once they see something, they think, oh, but we also want that. And whatever comments come out, we add to our sprint backlog list. And then from there, um, and then after the sprint demo meeting, we have another meeting, which is just a quick, maybe one hour, so guys, what worked during the sprint, what can we do different, and what didn't work, and how are we going to change it? And then what we do is we take that information, and the next sprint, we actually change it. We change the way we work, or we implement new things. So this is what a typical two-week sprint looks like. So I usually have my demos on a Friday morning, where I invite business. It's never longer than two hours, and this is where we get feedback. Straight after that, we have our sprint retrospective to say what worked, what didn't work, what are we going to change? And then for the rest of the Friday afternoon, we sit and we do planning for the next week, next two weeks. And then you'll see from Monday to the next Thursday, we have our 15-minute stand-ups. And that gives enough time. So like I said, it's about nine days that we have in a two-week sprint. And for the rest of the day, these guys can literally just focus on what they have to deliver. So um, the gets sort of works better if your whole organization gets into a rhythm. Yes, yeah. And also, every team has got their own rhythm. I like the Friday afternoon because usually when we're done planning, everybody's so tired, we just go home early, which is quite nice because, you know, people also do need a break. And I like going home early on a Friday afternoon. So that's, that is, the, but other teams have these meetings spread out across the week. I just prefer it all together because we know that Monday morning when we get back to the office, we've done our planning, the guys know exactly what they need to work on. Um, but our different teams have different rhythms and, whatever works for your team. And so what we have done the last sprint, the guys in the retrospective meeting says, they're so tired after the demo because they've stressed about it. Can't we move our planning meeting to the Monday? So we tried it for the next sprint, but it was almost like you start with the morning, but what are we going to do? 
Um, so we actually, the, the, the sprint after that, we moved it back to the Friday afternoon. Um, but it also helps now that they know that it's not going to work on the Monday. They're actually very focused. And we often don't spend four hours planning because these guys just literally want to get it done. And, and, but as a scrum master, I need to make sure that they do it properly. Because if those tasks are not defined properly and broken down in small enough elements, we're not going to have a good sprint. I'm not going to go through this because I did speak a lot about um, the different types of meetings. The planning meetings just where we sit and, and talk about it. But I'll just go through what we do at clientele. So we, I'd, like I said, we meet on the Fridays. We, decide, we, we sit with the business owner. The business owner tells us what is our sprint goal for the next week. So he decides what is it that we need to work on and what is the priority for the next sprint. Then we decide on the user stories that will meet the sprint goal. Um, we take those stories, we break it down into smaller tasks, sketch out the stories, decide what's the best approach. And often you have quite an a energetic discussion there because these guys have got different ways of solving problems and um, it's nice to pull in the architect in those kind of meetings. So what is the best way to, to do certain things? And then we estimate and assign task user stories. So our estimation, like I said, I try and get the guys to do it half a day to one day per task because otherwise you don't see what's happening. As somebody might be sitting on the doing column for a whole week and then um, your whole team gets behind because he didn't tell you about a blocker. Okay, sprint review meeting. This is where we show the product to the business and get feedback. So how we do it, like I said, our scrum team and business stakeholders meet every second Friday morning. Um, so I will get up and tell him this is what we said we're going to deliver. And I'll say, we had a good sprint, or you know what, we had a really challenging sprint because three people had flu, or whatever happened. So just to create the context. And then the development team will each show what they've worked on. And like I said earlier, it's about accountability. They know they need to present, so they make sure that whatever they present is well tested and it does work. And then the product owner and stakeholders ask questions, give feedback on what they've seen. And then from this feedback, we might add additional functionality to our, our product backlog list. Um, what did I do now? Okay, then our re retrospective meeting, I just meet. Sorry? Oh, sorry. If you have two weeks, it's got two public holidays in it, or three or four, you can make it in a three week sprint with all the public holidays, or do you try and do it sort of two weeks with these days? It, de it depends. So, for example, we had. A um, like next week, we've got our, our, our year-end function, so we know it's going to be a later one. So we either say we're going to push it out to be three weeks, or we say we're just going to add less stars to our planning. Um, especially over April, we had a couple of those, so I think what we did there is we moved it to a three-week sprint, and we just changed, changed the, the meetings for that. So it just depends on what works for the team. I mean, sometimes, especially over winter, we had people who were sick, um, because initially when, when they um, revamped this dungeon, the roadmap team sat there, and there's no air in that room, and being winter, and they have the air gone on, my whole team got sick. So it was, we actually had to, at the end of the two weeks, say, guys, I know this was a sprint goal, but we didn't deliver on the sprint goal. A um, couple of weeks ago, we had um, also some issues, and I've actually asked if we could um, just cancel our demo meeting, and then um, instead of reorganizing everything, we just had a four-week sprint instead of a two-week sprint. So it just kept everything the same, just canceled the one Friday's meetings, and then we just had it two weeks later that Friday. So, so, so you have to adapt because sometimes things happen. You know, people get sick or, you know, the one guy had to go on family responsibility leave. He, he was away for, for seven days. So all of a sudden you think that somebody will do something in the nine days, and then he's not there. Um, so you have to be able to adapt and just, just always talk to your business owners and make sure that everybody knows what is happening. Yeah. Okay, so retrospective meeting, this is where we sit and we say, okay, guys, what, what's working, what's not working, and how are we going to do things differently? Um, sometimes what we try is we do a habit tracker. Um, I don't know if you know Seinfeld. He said that it's, sometimes he works for two years on a joke. But he decided that the way he's going to make sure that he actually gets enough jokes done is by writing a joke every day. So he put a calendar up in the beginning of the year, and he said every day he writes a joke, he'll put a red cross on the day. And for him, it wasn't about writing 
a good joke every day. It's just about writing something every day and not breaking that chain of the red crosses. And so we would put up a habit tracker in our scrum room where we say, these are the two new habits we're going to adopt this, this week. And every morning during the stand-up, we will make a cross to say, did we display this new habit or this new behavior that we wanted to do? Um, so that's one of the ways that we try and implement new ways of doing things. And like I said, we wanted to move our sprint planning meeting to the Monday. It didn't work out. So the next sprint, we just changed it again. Um, so it's just about finding a way for the team to work better and to, to improve our quality every, every sprint. Okay. Um, hmm. okay. All right, so like I said, I meet alone with the de development team. I don't always want the business owners to be involved, but you can probably um, invite them, but I just find that the team is a bit more open when, when you do, um, when you're just um, sitting alone with them. Open forum to get feedback, so we just write down things on sticky notes, whatever comes up, and then we discuss it afterwards. And um, it needs to be a culture of not blaming. Um, so focus on what worked, what is positive, what are we keep on, going to keep on doing, and then as a team we decide what do we need to change or do better. It's not just me telling them, oh gosh, you need to change this. As a team we decide, okay, this is the things that we are going to do differently. And then review what we have changed in the last sprint. If it's not working, then we just change it again. And then the daily stand-up is our 15-minute meeting every morning. And um, this is where we get together with our product owners. Sometimes business pitches up, sometimes they don't. But they're there 90% of the time. Um, we just talk about what, we do, what we're focusing on and what we are going to do for the next day. Oops. Okay. So, like I said, we, we've got our stand-up rooms, and I'll show you some photos now. Um, some people have the actual whiteboards where they move the tasks. And what happens is a developer will stand there. He will take his task from yesterday and move it from the doing to the done column, obviously if he's completed it. And then he'll go to the to-do list and take a task and say, oh, I will work on this one today. So it's quite a, a, a thing, a visual thing, that they say, this is what I am working on. Um, we've also got Asana, which is a digital board where you can actually just drag and drop your, your tasks in the columns. Okay, and then it's focus meeting, 15 minutes. If you want to discuss anything else, we'll do it after the scrum meeting. So this is, um, on the left, this is our roadmap scrum room. It's a very small room. Uh, we've got a little table there where we usually plug in the computer. And then um, you'll see on the right-hand side, um, Mashadi, she's one of our testers. She's just moving whatever she's busy working on on the, on the task board. Um, so I just want to show you another video. This is just about showing your stakeholders what you're working on. What is it? This gem is the internet. <laughs> surprising things about it. Hang on. It doesn't have any wires or anything. It's wireless. Oh well, yes, everything's wireless nowadays, isn't it? So I can really use it in my speech. What if someone needs it? Oh, no, no. People will still be able to go online and everything. It'll still work. Oh, good. good. I tell you, you present this to the shareholders and you will get quite a response. Mm -hmm. Can I touch it? Of course it is, Jen. The internet doesn't weigh anything. <laughs> no, of course it doesn't. <laughs> hey! What is Jen doing with the internet? Mark said I could use it for my speech. Are you insane? What if she drops it? I won't drop it. I'll look after it. No, 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 Jen. No, this, this needs to go straight back to Big Ben. Big Ben? Yeah, it goes on top of Big Ben. That's 
where you get the best reception. All right, I promise I won't let anything happen to it. No, Jen, I'm sorry, but the elders of the internet would never stand for it. No, Roy, I spoke to the elders of the internet not one hour ago. I told them about Jen winning Employee of the Month, and they were so impressed that they wanted to do whatever they could to help. Wait a minute. The elders of the internet. The elders of the internet know who I am? You've got to let me have it! No, Jen, I'm sorry. It's just too risky. Oh, please, Roy. Oh. Well, Moss, has it been completely demagnetised? By Stephen Hawking himself. <laughs> Sends his congratulations, by the way. Well, if it's okay with the hawk. So, can I have it? You can. <laughs> oh, don't forget your speech. Oh, thank you. Shh. Right. Well, I'd probably deem it doesn't look like that, I promise. <laughs> Any question? Two questions. Yeah, sure. The first one, you talked about user stories. Um, who developed those for you? Do you have a stakeholder in the room? Do you have a product owner doing it? Or yeah. is your team doing it? Yeah, so what we would do, it also depends on the project. So, for example, the, the operational guys, they will just get a, a, a bug or something to fix and they will develop a user story for that. Um, I'm now busy scoping the new Billings project. So I'm sitting with um, the Billings team and a couple of other stakeholders, and we say, so what are the features for this? And then from that, as, a, as, a, as part of a workshop, we actually write these user stories. So um, let's have, I use the example of the application form. It would be something like, as a business, um, let's say a broker administrator, I want to be able to capture the new broker information on an online form. So then we'll take that and say, okay, based on this story, what are the things that we need to build? So it might be an actual application form that's got the same fields in then the physical application form and some back-end stuff, whatever IT guys do. Um, then, for example, in the demo, we will show the application form and then the guy from compliance will sit there, oh, guys, it would be really nice if we can add the... Um, the, the signed contract to this application form. So then I will make a note on my product backlog list that, you know, add signed contract. And then when I'm sitting with a team and we're doing the, the, the planning session, we write a user story based on that requirement that came out of the meeting, and then the guys will take it and break it down in the task, what they need, you know, create upload functionality and, and whatever the other case. Is. So it's, it's sort of a combination, and it depends on, you know, when, when the story arrives. Um, if, if that makes sense. So there, there are different ways that it can come into the system and then we just need to make, make sense of the story. Uh, and sometimes we need to go back to business or whoever to get more requirements for the story. Um, to say, okay, so you said you want this, um, but what is it that, what that you actually want? Um, so, so it comes from different, different sides. But usually it would be business that gives you the requirement and they say he wants to do that and then we will just break it down in tasks. So the, the things that come in. Yeah, so if you do a retrospective and there's a whole lot of stuff and they say, oh, it would be really nice for it to be blue instead of pink or maybe how do you balance that? Well, the business owner needs to tell us what's priority. Um, so, for example, um, we've got now this list of all these brokers that we captured the application form. Now, one of the things that they want is, um, so the, the search functionality, they can search for the brokers, but now they want it alphabetically. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of the requirements are added to the list. And then when we work through the list, we say, so what is the priority? Now, although that, that, that requirement has been locked a long time ago, it's never been a priority. Um, there, are more, there are other things that are more important. So basically, it's the product owner that needs to say, what is it? And often we need to guide them and say, it's, it's great that you want this now, but it will make more sense if we build something else earlier. So that's the nice thing about Agile is you can actually 
change things in, in, in a way that makes sense. Um, other times there are just things that you have to do now and you need to drop everything um, because it is a business requirement or legislation's changed. Like for example, with the, the increase in VAT, we literally had to drop everything and change things across this, all systems because our commission calculations, the way we were billing things, oh, just, just everything was, um, we had to change things to, to, to make sure that our systems could accommodate for the VAT, VAT changes. Any other questions? All right, so artifacts, I'll go through this quickly. We spoke about some of it before. So those are the, the things that we produce to make whatever we do visible. So it is our backlog list. It's our user stories. It is our scrum board. So those are all the, the things that people can see what we are busy working on. So it helps in decision making. If you have a user story, you know sort of what it is that business wants, and it helps us to ma make a decision on how to do it. Same with our board, we can see one of the tasks are stuck in the doing column. Maybe we need more information, so it just helps us to see, um, to, to make decisions. <coughs> Oops. Okay, keeps track of what work to do and what work was done. We spoke about that, and Scrum has no documentation is a myth, because there is still documentation. You can't build a system without requirements. Uh, what we do is we have a wiki. So I'm, uh, because I'm a little bit old school and I come from a waterfall, Thing. I like it when I've got a signature on my documentation. So I would do a spec to three pages just to say, these are the business rules, these are the calculations for the commission, and then I just get the people who actually agreed on it to sign off um, on that document. But then I would put all my requirements on the wiki, and then the developers will also do their code or whatever else they've done on the wiki as well. So it's, it's accessible to everybody. So we've got a clientele wiki where we saw our documentation. Okay, so we spoke about product backlog. That's the big list of all the requirements, and then that feeds into your sprint backlog, depending on what your goal is, and then your task cards are your, are your user stories. So I'm not going to bore you with that. And then you get other, oh, other, um, wow, what's wrong here? Okay. I think this, this um, computer is tired now. All right, so you've got impediments. We lock that. So the business is aware that certain things are holding us back. We've got burn down charts just to measure the capacity of the team and are we, are we working up to capacity. Our product vision is what guides our user stories. And then you also have your sprint goal to say, this is what we're working on the sprint. And whatever we do is to get to that goal. Okay, so what we do is, beginning we've got a product vision, feeds into our product backlog. Then when we do our planning, we decide this is our sprint goal. From the sprint goal, we've got a sprint backlog. We have our two-week sprint, and then whatever was our goal, we try and deliver at the end of the two weeks. So just to show you how everything fits together. Um, I'm not going to go through this. This is just how our SANA board looks like. There's a long list of things that business wants. And when we do our sprint planning, we say, Based on the goal for the sprint, what are the tasks that we've got locked here that we need to add to our sprint um, backlog? This is one of the other sprint backlog boards. This is specifically for the app team. So all those little cards are either stories or functionality and requirements. Oops. Sorry, guys. I don't know what. Know what's happening here. Okay. And this is the, um, the actual Kanban board that they're using. So they've got the column to do, doing, done, and then as they are moving through it, they're moving their task cards. Okay. That was just a slide on task cards, and then I think we did speak about user stories and task cards. Uh, don't know what's wrong. Okay, and this is the Asana task card. So once you click on one of those user stories, it opens up. You can have your information there. You can say what is your priority. Um, and you can add all sorts of different information. And then just you can also assign it to different projects and different teams. Um, th these boards usually give you functionality to manage projects, to do reporting, and to, to also have, because some of the projects touch on different other teams as well. So you can link those teams to the cards. Um, 
not doing it. Okay. Right. And this is just a scrum process. I think we spoke about it extensively. Sorry? Yeah, I think maybe that's it. But I think we, we did touch on all the elements of Scrum, this process. Do you have any questions around that? No questions. All right, we, we're almost done. Promise. Okay, so Journey at Clientel, like I said, come long time ago. We come from a waterfall um, approach. When there was a big project, it, took, it looked like the initial project plan that I showed you. And then when there's on other stuff, people had to log an issue. Issue was investigated, and the IT guys would fix it. Then 2012, they started using some Kanban boards. 2015, they had one giant scrum team and everybody was just working on things. And this is where business would get together and fight over how many points they would get for the quarter. And then from about 2016, they started dividing the business in the dedicated project teams, um, like, Dion, like your question about how they were working together. And then um, last year, IT and product owners went on Agile training, and we, like I said, we're all in different phases of that journey um, across the different teams. Um, I'm going to skip this video. It just tells you about life after um, Scrum, which is more about culture and adopting the changes. Um, I know that it is almost 12 o'clock, so are you sure? You guys are okay on time? <laughs> all right, so this is just... Spotify used Scrum, but they, they almost what they're saying is they've moved on from Scrum. So I just want to, and they talk about the culture, culture of Agile. Um, any questions while I'm switching the video on? success factors here at Spotify is our agile engineering culture. Culture tends to be invisible. We don't notice it because it's there all the time, kind of like the air we breathe. But if everyone understands the culture, we're more likely to be able to keep it and even strengthen it as we grow. So that's the purpose of this video. When our first music player was launched in 2008, we were pretty much a Scrum company. Scrum is a well-established agile development approach and it gave us a nice team-based culture. However, a few years later, we had grown into a bunch of teams and found that some of the standard Scrum practices were actually getting in the way. So we decided to make all this optional. Rules are a good start, but then break them when needed. We decided that Agile matters more than Scrum, and Agile principles matter more than any specific practices. So we renamed the Scrum Master role to Agile Coach because we wanted servant leaders more than process masters. We also started using the term squad instead of Scrum team, and our key driving force became autonomy. So what is an autonomous squad? A squad is a small, cross-functional, self-organizing team, usually less than eight people. They sit together and they have end-to-end -end responsibility for the stuff they build. Design, commit, deploy, maintenance, operations, the whole thing. Each squad has a long-term mission, such as make Spotify the best place to discover music, or internal stuff like infrastructure for A-B testing. Autonomy basically means that the squad decides what to build, how to build it, and how to work together while doing it. There are, of course, some boundaries to this, such as the squad mission, the overall product strategy for whatever area they are working on, and short-term goals that are renegotiated every quarter. Our office is optimized for collaboration. Here's a typical squad area. The squad members work closely together here with adjustable desks and easy access to each other's screens. They gather over here in the lounge for things like planning sessions and retrospectives. And back there is a huddle room for smaller meetings or just to get some quiet time. Almost all walls are whiteboards. So why is autonomy so important? Well, because it's motivating, and motivated people build better stuff. Also, autonomy makes us fast by letting decisions happen locally in the squad instead of via a bunch of managers and committees and stuff. It helps us minimize handoffs and waiting so we can scale without getting bogged down with dependencies and coordination. Although each squad has its own mission, they need to be aligned with product strategy, company priorities, and other squads. Basically, be a good citizen in the Spotify ecosystem. Spotify's overall mission is more important than any individual squad. So the key principle is really be autonomous, but don't sub-optimize. It's kind of like a jazz band. Although each musician is autonomous and plays his own instrument, they listen to each other and focus on the whole song together. That's how great music is created. So our goal is loosely coupled, but tightly aligned squads. We're not all there yet, but we experiment a lot with different ways of getting closer. In fact, that applies to most things in this video. 
This culture description is really a mix of what we are today and what we are trying to become in the future. Alignment and autonomy may seem like different ends of a scale, as in more autonomy equals less alignment. However, we think of it more like two different dimensions. Down here is low alignment and low autonomy, a micromanagement culture, no high level purpose, just shut up and follow orders. Up here is high alignment, but still low autonomy. So leaders are good at communicating what problem needs to be solved, but they're also telling people how to solve it. High alignment and high autonomy means leaders focus on what problem to solve, but let the teams figure out how to solve it. What about down here then? Low alignment and high autonomy means teams do whatever they want and basically all run in different directions. Leaders are helpless and our product becomes a Frankenstein. We're trying hard to be up here, aligned autonomy. And we keep experimenting with different ways of doing that. So alignment enables autonomy. The stronger alignment we have, the more autonomy we can afford to grant. That means the leader's job is to communicate what problem needs to be solved and why. And the squads collaborate with each other to find the best solution. I just thought that's such a nice way to say what happens after our journey because at the end of the day this is where we want to get to. Um, but it does take time. Okay, so lessons learned. Top management support is crucial. If you guys, if you're not supportive, top, you, doesn't matter what you do, you'll still have some big boss walk into your office and tell you to do it and you'll just have to drop everything and do it. But if they understand the process and they see the results, that, 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 that is what's crucial to get this um, way of doing things done. Co-location co of teams, like I said, some of our teams are not co-located and you can see that things do, they don't talk as much as they have to. Um, business owners, product owners need to be part of your team. Um, like I said, if the team fails, it's not just the IT team that fails, it's actually the business owners that fails with, with them. Um, use visual tools, boards, sticky notes, drawings. Um, I get bored if I have to read a document like that, but show me a picture and I, I, I get it. And I see a lot of people, I think most of us are actually visual learners and we want to see things and draw things and, and that does work and that helps us on, on this journey. And there's no one size fits all. Like I said, every team's got their own personality. What works for my team doesn't work for some of the other teams. So find a way that works for your team, even if it's not the way of your whole company. Uh, and companies also need to be flexible in that, not just force everybody to have the same personality or same rhythm um, for Agile. Uh, Scrum is not a silver bullet. Like I said, we do say face issues, but we know we're on the right journey. And it's also not going to be the solution for every type of project. It works well in IT, but it's not going to work for all the other types of projects. Um, transparency is key. If people can see what you're working on, they have also more trust in the process and in your team. Um, it takes time. We did our training probably about 18 months ago, and we're not all there yet. Um, so, and some people just sit in their way. We've got people who've been working there for 20 years and they're very good at what they do, and they're not interested in doing things this way. And, and that's also fine, but it does take time, and eventually some of these people do get on board and they start doing the things that they need to do. And then remove distractions. Um, people need to focus on, on their goals. If you keep them in meetings, and, and we often see it, we've got, for example, very junior business analysts, and instead of getting the requirements and coming back to the team and sharing the requirements with the team, they pull the developers in these requirement se sessions. And that's not fair on the developers because all of a sudden they sit in meetings half of the time and they can't just focus on, on the work that they need to do. So you have to remove distractions. It's very and then trust cultivates trust. Like I said, sometimes the team sort the people out that, that don't do the work. But if you, if you do trust your teams, they will make sure that they can be trusted. If you say, today I'm working from home and I'm working on this, and you actually deliver it, tomorrow it's no problem if you want to work at home again because we trust you and we know that you're going to actually do what you say you're doing. Okay, so <coughs> this is just an analogy on how Agile has been for us. While I was preparing for this, my, I've got two daughters. One is seven, the other one's nine. And they said to me, Mom, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm busy putting some stick men on a slide. 
And the little one ran outside and she said, but there are no stick men on our side. So I said, try to explain to them that, no, I'm actually putting stick men on the slide. So when I did a dry run with them, they had to sit through this two hour presentation. So uh, yeah, anyways, they were very disappointed not to see any stick men on the slide. So I thought, well, it's actually quite a nice analogy of our journey. It's sometimes it feels like you're just going downhill and you have to dust yourself off, get up and try again next sprint. But other times it's actually quite a lot of fun to do agile and to see how things work. So this is just my, my stick men on a slide to show you that this journey is actually a lot of fun, but it's not always easy. And then I've got one last video, and then I'm really done. So do you have any questions before I show you this video? Was this interesting? Did you enjoy it? Okay, great. Um, this is an Apple ad, and Apple is one of the companies that do use Agile quite often. And I just want to end off by, with this to say that we live in a world where we need to do things differently. There's a lot of logic and following processes and things, but we always need to think, how can we do things better and how can we do it differently? And I think that's the nice thing about Agile, that you force yourself every second week or every four weeks, depending on how long your sprint is, to think about better ways to do things. So I'm just going to end off with this. And thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed being here with you today. Now, it will be funny if I didn't bring that video. I didn't. Can I try and play it from this? Otherwise, I won't be able to show you this video. So if it doesn't show. Here's to the crazy one. Okay, all right, let's do that. The misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. <laughs>